All right, so I'm, I'm gonna very quickly talk about a personal opinion about FIBS and some personal experience about phantom making business. Uh, a, um, if it works, a yep. bit of a, uh, why is it going like very slow, sorry. A bit of a disclaimer, uh, I'm absolutely biased about POCUS. So poke, pocus, pocus, and I'm going to say a lot of things that you might like and you might not like, and that's because I'm biased. I'm going to mention some brands uh, in this talk about the Phantom, one brand specifically, and um, I've got no association with them. I actually, they actually charge me a lot of money. Um, all right. Uh, there is, it's really slow because I'm looking at two screens. Okay. The... the the topic of my talk is basically focused around is FIB the way forward or backward? And the reason for it, I'm going to mention the different things in this talk. And they are, we're going to talk about whether a 1989 anesthetic, an anesthetic remedy done by EM physicians in 2021, which is finally part of the, the ARCAN curriculum, is the way forward or not. And I'm going to talk about blind technique, skin pop pop. Uh, infraingoinal, fib, supraingoinal, and the bow tie, and maybe peng, just to mention uh, a few fancy words, so it's recorded forever. The background of fib um, is a meta-analysis. There's a lot of, lot of research done around uh, the fasciolar compartment block. Um, uh, obviously, the, the meta-analysis and the, and the, the uh, article reviews are as good as the articles themselves. Sorry, guys, I'm getting distracted because I need to admit people at the same time. Um, and um, so the whole point of this analysis was the femoral nerve blocks are good, but the fascia local compartment blocks are as good as them. So do you need really need to do femoral nerve blocks? Um, uh, I've got personal opinion about that. I'm going to talk about it later. In a small uh, randomized control trial, uh, Obviously, this is common knowledge now that we know that fascia local compartment block are superior to IV morphine, and we we do them because we want to avoid all the problems that you get with IV morphine. And I have been personally involved in a case that ha did not have fascia local compartment block, and then as part of my actually quip that the patient ended up having a lot of morphine and went apneic and had to be tubed. Um, uh, a, another study in 2008 by Dolan just mentioned that ultrasound guided fascia local block is superior to the blind technique. Uh, the, the numbers were ridiculous, about like 80 to 48 percent, and you get the better sensory and motor loss. And just to put it out there for people to think, do you really need a motor loss for our patients? And that's one of the other things I want to talk about today. OK. Um, just a quick thing, why, how, and when? Why, obviously, because we want to uh, anesthetize. Uh, sorry, Michael, are you looking at the chat? Because I can't do that. Yes, I can help, I can help read out stuff from the chat. Okay, lovely, okay. Uh, because, of the, because you're gonna try to aim for the femoral nerve, the lateral cutaneous femoral nerve, question mark in front of it, because I'm gonna talk about that, and maybe obturator nerve, and when do you have to do it on every patient or if the pain score is really really high enough and or you're just going to do it as a tick box because you need to have to you need to do a dops right and that specifically becomes a um, part of your curriculum uh, from august you have to do a lot of it how um there are different ways of doing it but basically what you're trying to achieve is this this thing that everyone has seen uh, that shows the lateral to medial. You've got your fascia lata, which is your first pop off the skin, and your fascia iliaca, which goes around, as the name suggests, over the iliacus muscle. And then you've got the femoral nerve, which lies around here, lateral to your femoral artery. And then look at this, that the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve is actually, infraingoinally speaking, off the, fa um, your fascia, um, super, uh, like superficial, to your fascia iliaca. And look at how deep uh, or lat medial and far, far away from where you inject in here is your obturator nerve and the branches. Okay, so I'm full of thought. And then we're going to talk about an amazing thing that I found from the Gasman website uh, how to do a blind technique. Uh, 
everyone talks about, okay, this is the inguinal uh, ligament. You've got the pubic typical and you've got your ACEs and you go a centimeter inferior to that and inject around here off the skin, you go pop, pop. Obviously you're way off everything, including uh, uh, femoral artery and femoral vein. And then you're trying to achieve a local anesthetic spread like this that you see in here and hoping that you get the obturator nerve, which happens very, very rarely. And then you're going that way, hoping somehow their spread gets to the lateral cutaneous nerve. All right, so for the, for the one who said, oh, okay, this is not a blind webinar, it's a POCUS webinar. So let's just look at my uh, actual femoral nerve, my um, fascia iliaco. Uh, this is the iliacus muscle. This is your, or my, in this case, femoral artery. And then you've got the fascia iliaca there, which actually becomes kind of like a two branches to cover the femoral nerve in here. And then you want to insert your needle in plane, trying to go under the fascia iliaca to lift this up. And as we know, the fluid is going to look a bit anechoic or dark with this needle to spread around here to cover the femoral nerve. Okay, so that is the common practice that most, in my department, you can, you can raise your hand and tell me that this is absolutely wrong, this is not the way you do it. In my department, most, most clinicians or practitioners do. But what I hear a lot in day-to-day in -day is, well, we don't get amazing pain relief all the time. And there is a reason for it. Um, we said, in the beginning that this is a 1989 remedy uh, that was described initially and then kind of started to become a thing in two, early 2000 and then 20, day, 20 or 30 years later we're trying to be an advocate for it and becomes as part of our curriculum um, but what pain are you trying to control you're trying to control the fracture pain or a post-operative incision pain because you need to know what you're actually doing right because for a fracture pain You've got a broken bone and spasm in the muscle so you probably need to supply anesthetize the nerve that supplies that area whereas for a post-op pain there is a cut in the muscle and a lot of things have been added to the region so specifically for example if someone has had a cut laterally it makes sense to anesthetize the lateral cutaneous femoral nerve so why do you need to actually anesthetize that in, in, in A&E? All right, so looking at the hip, number one nerve in here is, is the, the femoral nerve. So this comes down here and branches. Number two, this is the anterior, space, anterior side of the hip and the um, um, basically your neck of femur. You've got the obturator nerve and the branches and posteriorly you've got a little bit of branches of sciatic nerve which contribute a little bit but not massive amount to the pain control of the hip. Then it was the supraingoinal fascia iliaca block. Uh, in a study recently, um, small RCT, it basically showed that this is way superior to the, to the inferior fascia iliaca compartment block. And why? The reason for it is, obviously we've got the same thing, and we said in here, the lateral femoral, femoral cutaneous nerve is actually branching off above the inguinal ligament, and the obturator nerve above the inguinal ligament goes posterior medially way off your area of interest where you're trying to anesthetize infrainguinally, if that makes sense. And the femoral nerve itself gives off a lot of branches um, to iliacus muscle and a lot of other uh, articular branches that supplies the hip all superior, sorry, adding another patient, admitting another patient, sorry, <laughs> it's a um, person. Um, <laughs> Supraingonally, you get a lot of other branches of the femoral nerve that um, contribute to the pain management or pain control of the hip. So that just on its own explain, looking at the anatomy, while you get uh, a better result, Super, performing this uh, uh, superinguinity compared to the inferinguinity. And we're going to have a look at this again. 
as Ola said. These branches of the femoral are actually coming off to the iliacus muscle way above the um, inguinal ligament. And, and you see the same, another branch down here that's way above the uh, um, inguinal ligament. All right, so let's, let's see how we can do the supraingonal fascia lica block. Um, so instead of putting your probe uh, over the inguinal ligament in a kind of like a transverse, slightly angulated um, lateral to medial, you're putting your probe like this. So you find ACES, you move intermedially with the pointer of your probe towards the ziphi sternum, between the ACES and the ziphi sternum. And then what you're going to see initially is, again, this is my ACES. So as I put the probe, this is my head and my feet will be down there. And I just move the probe slightly to see this, which is still part of the ileum down here. That will be the sartorius muscle. That would be the internal oblique. And these two will form the common thing that people mention, the, the, the bow tie sign. And then this muscle, big belly of muscle there is, is the iliacus muscle. And what's sat on top of it is your fascia iliaca. So what you want to do is insert your needle from the bottom part or towards the feed basically where the inguinal ligament is to aim supraingoinally and try and pierce the skin, pierce the um, fascia down here. So you're going to go through the sartorius muscle, yes. And then you get the fat spread down there. But what I hear is every day is, but it's hard and we can't do this this way because everyone else told us, oh, just do it transverse, do it the other way. And I, and I, I, I get a lot of comments that, oh, we can't see the femoral artery. And if there are other branches that we might actually hit um, uh, on the way in, in the sartorius or even around the fascia um, uh, over the iliacus muscle itself. How about the bowel? Obviously you've got, you're gonna have the bowel down there. If you look higher up under the internal oblique. So you're a bit far off because you're gonna come from this end, but it is possible, it is possible. And my, my suggestion is do what you're comfortable with doing. If, um, if you want to do the, the old school technique of putting your probe um, transfers and look at lateral to medial and, in, and in, in, in inserting your needle lateral to medial, try and go um, as high as possible supraingonally where you see the beginning of the femoral artery becoming superficial. And basically what you want to do is this, instead of putting it infraingonally down here, put your probe slightly higher up, as high as possible, and then go lateral. You see, you still see the femoral artery here. You see you've got the femoral nerve and you've got this big belly of the iliacus muscle. And obviously that is the fascia overlying it would be your fascia iliaca. And then you go over the sartorius as, as you were doing it with the other technique. And you still see the femoral artery here. You see your femoral nerve and you can see the spread of your local anesthetic. So just same technique, same thing. Instead of putting your probe all the way down, just put your probe higher up. How about PENG? What is PENG? Um, basically, there was a lot of studies, well, not a lot, a few studies that looked at the fact that the fascia local compartment block and uh, or only on average reduces your pain or a patient's pain by 3 to 0.4 on a scale of 0 to 10. And personally, I think one of the reasons behind is obviously many people do it infraingonally, many do it, many do it. all of these um, uh, assessments are done from 1989 up to now. And uh, many of these have done, have happened blind, infraingonally, obviously you're not gonna get the best pain relief from that. Uh, so overall 3.4. And then um, there are a lot of cadaver studies that they looked at the anatomy of the femoral, femoral nerve that gives a lot of articular branches that goes 
control direct dysentery branches, control the pain in the hip. And they are very close to kind of the pericapsular region next to the psoas tendon. And, and the idea was like, okay, so why do we just go and hit next to the psoas tendon and try to spread around there? We should see that this is, again, my um, femoral vein, femoral artery, and this is the my psoas tendon. This is the iliacus muscle and down here. And then this is the psoas muscle. And what you see, oh, sorry, apologies. And what you see in here, this is the my femoral head. And this is where the iliopubic eminence is. So if you actually inject around there and try to spread the local anesthetic with the curvilinear probe, you've done a pain block. I'm just mentioning it. I don't want anyone to go and do it from tomorrow. I, I'm quite biased about this. I've done a few of these and I've got good results, but part of me thinks, why do we need to do it if we actually manage to do fascia local block compartment block supraingunity and very well with using ultrasound and trying to achieve a better pain relief for our patients rather than just a tick box. There was another case series uh, done, um, uh, as you can see the names in here, I'm not gonna mention that, um, that the, there was a good reduction of up to seven um, in, in pain from 10 to three or nine to two. And it's just basically what it says in here is it's all about um, the, the, uh, the articular sensory branches. So the other point to mention is um, the, the pain block is, is really good for people who want to aim just for sensory. Um, and then as much as I'm keen and biased about using ultrasound and doing all sorts of new techniques in, in a and &E, I just asked this question, why do we need to aim for sensory only? It's not like the fact that we want to ask the patients to move. It's something that's really, really, really useful after an operation for patients, specifically in their physio, so they, can, they are able to move after having an operation. And as I said, um, I'm quite biased about my personal experience. I've had very good results in a very little number of these I've done. And I just don't know whether the patients really like me for saying that, oh, there were, that was great, we are pain-free now. All right, so summary of part one of my talk is blind technique, fascia local block is makes you tick a box than anything else, in my opinion. Uh, Infraingonal fascia local block, good, but not the best. Rem remember, the branches of femoral uh, and uh, obturator nerve, they go apart um, and they, 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 you get a lot of branches of supraingonal that you're not actually um, um, anesthetizing. If worried about the cathode bow tie style, as I explained the first time, just go as high as you can see in the lateral to medial, your old technique, and you will get better results, believe me. Uh, I'm gonna talk quickly, we'll move to the second part of the talk, if that's okay, Michael. And which is uh, the- Actually, Maybe, Mara, just before you move on, I might just read out a couple of things from the chat, if that's okay. okay. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, so we have Jim Harris on the line. Professor Harris, is that yourself? who made some interesting comments about, uh, apparently in Melbourne, there's some nurses who do fascia iliaca blocks. Yeah, look, thank, thank you so much for um, inviting me. I, I, I'm far too out of touch with London. It's great to hear some London voices. And this is an awesome yeah. presentation. It's, uh, it's really good. Um, and uh, greetings to you all. Yeah, and you were saying uh, in Melbourne, apparently the nurses are doing the fascia iliaca blocks. So St. Vincent's in Melbourne serves mm. a, an older than average population. And one of the things that was introduced, I think now probably 20 years ago, was we got a lot of the nurses to do fascia iliaca blocks at triage. And certainly where I'm working now, and when I worked at WIPS, we put them in at triage. Our argument was even if the diagnosis turned out not to be enough, you've provided analgesia because they've got an acute hip syndrome. One of the most painful aspects of the journey through emergency medicine is getting a radiograph and the better analgesia you've got the better the radiograph will be so i, I certainly it's my practice out here although the young population of Qatar sees very few nuffs um, i was intrigued by the super inguinal technique i confess i've never tried it i, I use pain blocks or i use as high as i can infra um, and um, I, I've never looked at another one because I found those two techniques worked very well. 
in the population I serve, at least. Hmm. Well, thanks very much for sharing that. Thank that's you really... very much. Yeah, that's, that's very yeah. interesting. Yeah. Um, so I, I think I think the main struggle is that, uh, well, I, I certainly speaking from my, my experience in, in Georgia's, that um, it's it's it is a struggle providing it even after after this is confirmed enough and uh, because because i'm very against oh this is just a blind technique do it and then you're just going to find something or maybe i need to be just a bit more kind of like oh that's fine let's at least do a blind technique even before the x-ray which i totally agree is it's really 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 important and it's really helpful for the patients um, i do with ultrasound i, I personally I don't use blind blocks. I recognise that yeah. blind block is accepted by the Royal College of Anaesthetists. One yes. of the blind blocks it does support. Uh, but uh, just to clarify, everything I'm doing is is oh, okay. ultrasound guided. So I'd hate to, <laughs> if I'm in triage, that's my role. I've got my ultrasound with me and I'll be putting this block in, just as I would immediately put 20 mils of lignocaine into any prospective shoulder dislocation. Yes. I'd ultrasound it and if, this, if, if it was... Uh, if ultrasound showed dislocation, I would just pop in 20 mils and then I would supplement that with an interscaling block later if the simple intracapsular stroke hematoma block was insufficient. Yes. Um, I mean, obviously, everything that you're saying makes sense, of course, and that would be the ideal. But I think it's understandable to say that we are far from ideal and um, and anyone else who wants to add anything please do because i don't uh, with the numbers that we see in my department and, and and it would be extremely unlikely that something like that would be taken up by the by the practitioners anytime soon that's again i i kind of think like that's that is a problem do we do you agree michael or anyone else yeah uh i think it is often a problem, yeah, having enough providers to actually do a block. Like often where I work, it's only some of the consultants and registrars who actually can do it. And often they're you know, caught up with all the senior decision making. So I think if we were able to train up some nurse practitioners, that would really help. Uh, there's another question from the chat um, from Shiran. Does the positioning change the efficacy of the supraingual block, uh, i.e. does gravity have an effect? Um, so it's anecdotally after after any sort of a, um, a block that I do, I just massage a little bit for a, for helping to spread, and and I don't know whether there is evidence behind it or not. Don't ask me. I can I can search for that. And um, but um, uh, overall, yes, I, I realized that I, because I didn't want to go through how to do the whole thing. Uh, I know people have got. I didn't, that's the reason I didn't mention the the amount to give and what to give. Uh, people use different things. Obviously, the common practice in the UK is to use lever bupivacaine 0.25. And the com very common thing I've seen in many, any different trusts is, oh, if they are above 50 kilo, you give them 40. If they're less than four, uh, 50 kilo, give them 30 mils of that. You can mix it a little bit with, with lidocaine if you want to achieve a faster thing. I personally don't give anything to anesthetize the skin. I don't know whether that's good practice or bad practice. I'll just give them one pop off the, uh, off the lever bupivacaine. And uh, I don't know if um, what other, what other, What's the usual practice for other people? Um, in there is no evidence for the superangular is you need to still use the higher volume, and uh, uh, so you still still aim for the forty mils. And um, I have I have had to sometimes uh, 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 check the actual amount they give, and I have given more than forty mils if I needed to because obviously the for levobupivacaine the maximum safe dose would be two milligram per kilogram. About PENG, uh, you, you can't actually give that much and you don't need that much. So I normally use 20 mils. And I when I say normally, it's probably something that I shouldn't be saying normally uh, after five that I've done in my practice. And um, if that may I'll answer some of the questions that the people were asking in there. Um, yeah, that's great. Um, there's one other question uh, from, from Jay. Uh, is superinguinal more effective than infrainguinal? Um, evidence and my personal practice is that yes, and 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 that's the reason that I mentioned uh, uh, because it makes sense because you've got the um, uh, the obturation nerve is closer to the femoral nerve uh, superinguinally in the fascia, and then from you 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 will achieve 
um, the, fem uh, the iliacus branches of the femoral nerve and some of the branches that go to the arti uh, articular branches of the femoral nerve that, that give off uh, um, superingonally. So that kind of makes um, makes it can now, well, okay. Uh, it makes it makes it that it that it's something that's it, you achieve better results. And personally, if I go higher up, I'll I've always had good experience with that personally. So and evidence evidence confirms that as well. Great, thanks very much. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, would you like to move on to your yes, phantom? the phantoms of Georges, uh, <laughs> and. Um, this is going to be a very little talk about. Um, so, what is a phantom? This is just as fun. Imaging phantom, or simply a phantom, is is just a designed object that's scanned or imaged in the field of the medical imaging to do whatever you want to do with it. You want to use uh, make something that you use for a vascular access, or or we can talk about other things. They I've had in the last 10, 9 months, I've played with different things, and um, uh, I normally organize regular workshops. Uh, that uh, I try for the junior, even nurses or doctors to teach them at least how to do vascular access. So I've used gelatin, I've used ballistic gel powder, I've used the blocks. I buy stuff from Amazon and there is a company in the UK, the ballistic, you can buy the ballistic gel powder, but then mo most recently I've bought blocks from a company called Clear Ballistic, uh, uh, a, a bliss, ballistic gel blocks from America. So I might soon go onto the CIA list because the ballistic gels are actually, you can use them for shooting and that's the normal thing that you actually people buy from for. Um, what do I think? Um, I don't like the um, um, agar agar and the gelatin. You actually get a good um, ultrasound view with them, but they like, they last about two days. And, um, uh, where with the ballistic gel block, from my point of view, is the winner, although it's probably twice uh, as expensive as the rest of them. But I've had a ballistic gel, uh, which I show you in about a couple of months now. I've used it many times. It's, it's so good. It doesn't, it, it doesn't need to be kept in the fridge and um, it doesn't need anything, to be honest. You just leave it and it just stays forever. Uh, they claim up to three years, and I kind of feel like they're right. Whereas the ballistic gel powder, which I bought from the UK brand, lasted four days, not four years. Um, so, and it's reusable. So every time that you don't like it, if you've managed to put it in a shape that you want it, and then people use it, put a lot of needles in it, just put it back in the oven and you can use it again. And I've done that in the last two months. Uh, all right. So uh, ballistic gel block, they come in, in blocks. Can people still see me as well if I show something. Yeah, we can see both screen and yeah. you. Yeah. yeah, can you see this? Yep. So this is this is a layer that I've made from the block and I added some color to it and look at look at the consistency and how it is. Um, so the way to make it, you actually need to get the block itself, which you order from the clear ballistic shipped from the US. And so one pound of it, 450 grams, would cost you about $22. And uh, so just get a few pounds of that and then put one shipping fee. Get a container, whatever that you like, that you can put it in the oven or a slow cooker. And you need 120 degrees uh, for a few hours. I normally keep, leave it there for two hours to, for it to become quite um, liquidy. And then... The ballistic gel itself, as close as it gets to the human tissue, it doesn't have a cogenicity that you want on the ultrasound. So you need something that gives you fibery look on the, the ultrasound. So I use psyllium husk. It's just something that you can buy from Amazon, from any, any sort of any brand. It's not very expensive. One pack of it, one kilo of it would cost you 15 quid and it would last you a year at least, if not more. And because you just add about one tablespoon for every 200 grams after you uh, gel block is kind of in the liquid form and then after you've got the consistency you removed all the bubbles and everything just put it in the container of choice the way that you want it the thickness that you want the shape that you want and uh, just put them and let let it just uh, uh stay in in the cold in room temperature is good enough as well even doesn't necessarily need to be in the fridge and the tubing just use any tubing that you want this is this is my can you see this 
and this yep. is just a balloon balloon that I use uh, for uh, mimicking a vessel, and I just fill it with with colorful water uh, for vein or artery or something like that. Um, and then basically they've got the different layers, different th thicknesses that you've just made, and someone is entering, admitting them, and then you just put them layer by layer on top of each other, and put your balloons in the middle. And then you get something like this. Or if you want to actually to see what it looks like from the side, this has been cannulated today. I had an F2 session and junior doctor session practice. So it doesn't, doesn't sound, doesn't look very exciting, but it really works well. Can everyone see that? Yep. All right. And this is what you get actually on the ultrasound. And this is just a random, you can see. So without the, without the adding the psyllium Haas, you're not gonna see this. You just see a clear uh, kind of like, very, very like a clear going through anechoic area. And then you can actually see I've added different layers with different consistency of the fibers to create a deep vein. And you can actually play with it and create a superficial vein, more superficial than the two centimeter. And so you can just play with different different things that you want. It's, the world is yours, basically. And what else can I make with this? The world is yours. Just, just play anything. You can use different gel consistency. You can add a bit of a more of your psyllium husk to make something um, a different. Uh, you can add... Um, uh, the, the gel itself, when you order it online, it comes in different consistency itself. So zero and one are really good in terms of like uh, uh, giving you the muscle and the skin consistency, whereas you can go super, super like number two or three, which is going to be very, 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 um, um, what's the term, uh, easily uh, 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 cannulated, if that's the term. Um, and then, yeah, like, just giving a speech, uh, sorry, warming up everyone for the amazing talk that Michael is going to say. So this is the this is the phantom I made to practice serratus anterior for the department, and you can see that um, uh, basically you can actually see the fascial layers, the rib, another fascial layer, and and Michael is going to talk about this in detail. So we had a we had a practice with that as well. Uh, I've run about five or six sessions and I normally ask all the practitioners to, to tell me their opinion about it. I've had about 90% satisfaction uh, in that looks like the human tissue, feels like it's human tissue, sorry. And the needling experience was reported to increase the operator confidence in about six sessions I've run about more than 50 of our practitioners from the most junior to SD6 level. Uh, they felt that uh, the, 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 um, the confidence was increased in terms of like um, ultrasound needling experience. Uh, summary of part two, I think just buy the ballistic gel, don't waste your money on gelatin or agar agar, although it's cheaper, but you need to buy them more regularly. So generally it would be easier to just buy one, one block of um, uh, ballistic gel and just use that. And then you can, this, this one I showed you, I've, I've, I've already put it in the oven about five times, uh, not because, it wasn't working the first uh, couple of times. It was just because I just was trying different consistency and just see actually this is true that I can use it in the oven and then uh, uh, mold it to it another shape that I want the next time. And it's been absolutely working fine without any problem. And, uh, and I think generally vascular access is the perfect starting point. It wouldn't cost you that much and it lasts forever, to be honest, literally. And you can teach uh, your, your um, um, nurses, your PAs, uh, with basic vascular access to begin with, and that would be a good starting point for everyone. Thank you very much. Amazing. Thank you very much uh, for that amazing talk. It's fantastic. Um, would anyone like to ask any questions? How about you, um, Stefan? Presumably in Sweden, nobody gets fractured NOFs because you have such good healthcare that everyone's already set up with OT before they could possibly fall over. Is that right? No, they do get they do get practice knobs. I'm just okay. just kind of amazed of all the stuff you use ultrasound for. So I am I am happily listening. 
very impressed. Oh, you're very kind. Thank you. Um, uh, I think is there anything on this optimized technique and I've used? Is there anything else in the chat that we need to? Uh, oh yes, uh, Professor Harris has just said. Um, we just there's a bit of a sub uh, chat going on talking about whether ultrasound can be used uh, to exclude fractures. So potentially in a group where the uh, X-ray is normal and you're wondering whether to do a CT or an MR. Um, there was a radiologist that Woolwich who suggested using ultrasound to look for a hip joint effusion. And then if there's no effusion, then you could use that with a normal X-ray to rule out an off and then they don't need to go on to have CT MR. Obviously that's not part of any official guideline. Um, and then Professor, Professor Harris is just saying uh, that he's seen uh, NOFs diagnosed by CT with no effusion yes. or cortex. So I wanted to say yeah. the same thing, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think also if you do a CT MR, you might pick up other things like, you know, like pubic rami fractures often you'll see, which were not really obvious on the initial X-ray. So I'm not sure about that role. Yes, I, I totally agree with that. Yes, um, yeah, absolutely. Rick, any yeah. other questions for Mayrad? Feel free just to unmute yourself and shout out if you like. Absolutely, because we're not doing too many things. Okay, let me, I I have to make you host now. Yes, hand over the brains to me. Well, I can just reclaim it from you, actually. Can you? I've reclaimed it, yeah. I am the oh. host now. Oh, okay, lovely. Okay, so can you guys see that? You can see everything. You can, excellent. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna try and make this uh, really interactive. So uh, I'm gonna be talking about um, well, ultrasound for patients with rib fractures. So a little bit about diagnosis and then mostly focusing on uh, nerve blocks. So first, uh, if you could take out your mobile phones and go to www.menti.com and then enter this eight digit code. As we go along, I'll ask you a few questions and you can vote on what you think you do and so I'm just admitting a few patients, as you may read, as we go along. Uh, and so, yeah, hopefully this will, will make it interactive. If not, I'd actually be really interested to know what you all do for these patients. So we'll start with the case. Uh, so it's a 78-year-old male who had he'd been fine the last few days, and he just has a simple fall, no preceding symptoms, and just bangs his chest on the edge of a table at home. And so he's just got focal tenderness on his left lateral chest wall. And he has a chest x-ray, which you can't really see any obvious rib fractures. There's no pneumothorax, no hemothorax. Uh, so yeah, no obvious significant chest injury on the x-ray. Sorry, Mark, some people are asking for the code again, please. Ah, yes. Okay, so the code is at the top of the screen here. So 17, actually, maybe you could type it into the chat, Mayrad. 17413605. Done, that's it. Great. So yeah, we've got a 78 year old male. Uh, so he's already been given some simple analgesia. Uh, he's still got a bit of pain at rest, a bit worse when he takes a deep breath or coughs. He's generally pretty good for 78, no significant men uh, medical history, maybe just some early cognitive impairment. Uh, clinical frailty score of four. Uh, he lives alone, so a little bit vulnerable. Vital signs are all normal. And in the department, he's able to you know, get up and go to the toilet by himself. Uh, and as we said, the chest X-ray, you think probably normal, maybe one very subtle rib fracture, but pretty much normal. So the first question is, what would you do for this gentleman? And I've just given you three options. So yeah, using ultrasound to look for rib fractures is not an option. You have to choose one of the other three. So either discharge him home with analgesia and advice, do a CT, or admit him. So I think a few of you are still logging in, so I'll give you a, a minute. So I put this question to a Dutch audience, actually, just a week or two ago, and they all said uh, that they would discharge him with oral analgesia. So interesting that the UK audience is a bit more trigger-happy on CT. I wonder if you'd have any trouble 
uh, selling a CT request to the radiologist in this situation, if the chest X-ray is completely normal and he's got normal vital signs. Um, but yeah, it sounds like most of you would do a CT, a couple of you would send him home and one would admit. Okay, so we'll come back to that case in a sec. Um, so the next question is why bother identifying rib fractures? So you know, the traditional dogma uh, with rib fractures was we don't do a chest X-ray just to look for rib fractures. You know, if you put query rib fractures on the chest X-ray request, it gets thrown back in your face. But maybe uh, that sort of old dogma is is now becoming a bit outdated because there's actually an increasing appreciation recently that actually the number of rib fractures is significant. And we'll look and we'll see that there is actually some data showing that the number of rib fractures actually correlates with the risk of complications. So you may have heard of this thing called the Stumble Score. Quite a few centers in the UK are now using this to help stratify and help decision-making for patients with rib fractures. It was devised by um, a lady, Kerry Battle, who I think is an emergency physician from Wales. And it's basically a composite of five things. So the Stumble Score is made up of your age, whether you've got chronic lung disease on anticoagulation, uh, if you're hypoxic, but also the number of rib fractures is quite a big part of the score. So you get three points for each rib fracture. Uh, and so if you have a score of less than 10, then you've got quite a low probability of complications. And then there's a pretty much linear sort of correlation as you get, as the score goes up, the probability of complications goes up. Uh, so for this chap, uh, 78 year old, so he already scores uh, a seven for his age. If he did have even just one rib fracture, he'd already be sort of into the second tier of complications. And if he had a couple, you know, he might even be higher. So I think you could, you can make an argument that identifying the number of rib fractures in this kind of patient can actually be important. And if you're using a stumble score for your sort of decision-making about admission, then it could actually make the difference between admitting someone or not. So if we go back to Menti and the next question, uh, yeah, so how important do you think it is to know exactly how many rib fractures this man has based on the fact that whether your center uses the stumble score or not, uh, do you think this is actually going to change your management? If, if the chest x-ray look normal, but then actually you, you put the scanner on and you see there is actually one or two rib fractures, do you think that could change your management? Oh, excellent. Everyone's agreeing. Well, that's uh, very heartening because otherwise the next section of this talk would be completely redundant if you'd all said, no, it's not important. So that's great. So next section is just a little bit about how to use ultrasound to diagnose rib fractures, which I must say I don't do very often, but yeah, I think occasionally in this kind of situation where you've got someone quite frail and you're not sure if maybe they've got a couple of rib fractures or not, in that group, I think actually maybe it is quite useful. Uh, and there was a meta-analysis on this topic uh, in 2016, and it found that POCUS is more sensitive than chest X-ray for rib fractures. So, um, oh, whoops. Uh, where are we? Oh, yeah. So yeah, so, uh, sensitivity of 97 versus 77. So, and this fits with my experience. Certainly I've had a few cases where chest X-rays look normal, but then with ultrasound, I've picked up one or two rib fractures. How to scan the ribs. Uh, it's pretty simple, just like scanning any bone really. Um, place the probe at the point of maximum tenderness, uh, but obviously very gently. And if the patient's able to, you could even have them place the probe on the chest themselves. So you're not causing any unnecessary pain. And then rotate the probe into the long axis of the rib, remembering that the ribs kind of come up as they go back. And then you simply slide along in the long axis, looking for any break in the cortex. And I normally sort of scan you know, 10 centimeters each way from where they're complaining of pain and then also the ribs above and below. So you're scanning that whole area. And rib fractures just look like any other bony fracture. So here you can see the bright white cortex with the shadow behind. And here is a little step. And this one slightly more displaced. Sometimes you see a little hematoma associated with it as well. So they're quite easy to spot. Uh, so next we'll just go back to Menti again. Uh, the next question is, in your hospital, how do you decide which patients with rib fractures to admit? And you have three options. Is it just a case by case with no official guideline? Do you have a guideline without a scoring system or do you have a guideline with a scoring system? So like, for example, the stumble score. Okay, a bit of a mix of answers there. So quite a few of you, it sounds like, are using 
Uh, I presume that's the stumble score, the scoring system that you're using there. And yeah, definitely some of the trauma centers in London just over the last year have, have taken this on in their um, root fracture pathways. Okay, so next, um, just talk about the analgesic options. Uh, there are several. So IV opioids, I guess, is the simplest one for us to prescribe as emergency physicians, because we just write it down and then the nurse gives it. Uh, but as uh, Mayrad was saying, you know, these are problematic, especially in the elderly, causing delirium, and especially with chest injuries, you know, they can increase the risk of pneumonia and atelectasis. A thoracic epidural is probably the gold standard in terms of pain relief, but then this is limited by having someone who can actually perform it. And also if the patient's anticoagulated, it's contraindicated, and you need to be able to position them appropriately. So there will be a significant group of patients who can't have an epidural. Paravertebral block can kind of be considered in a similar group to epidural. Um, you do go quite close to the, uh, to the spinal cord and also close to the lung. So it's probably not uh, an ideal block for ED. It's got relatively high risk, probably shouldn't be performed if someone's anticoagulated. Uh, a rectus spiny plane block is a relatively new block, which does seem very promising. There's not much uh, good evidence for it yet, but it does seem to be effective uh, for rib fractures. But the block that we're going to focus on today is the serratus anterior plane block, because I think this is probably the most commonly used block, and it probably has the best evidence for it. Uh, and for several reasons, I think it's, it's well suited to emergency department. So yeah, it was, I think the main advantages are that it's safe and easy to perform. Uh, it was originally described in 2013 by Rafa Blanco. Uh, and then over the subsequent few years, it's been taken up over uh, in quite a few different emergency departments across the UK, even despite the fact that there was really only quite limited evidence, case reports, case series. Uh, but now, as of this year, just a couple of months ago, there was actually an RCT um, published on this topic, which I believe is the first one. So just 60 patients from Turkey, uh, and they were randomized into either serratus anterior block or uh, tramadol PCA. And the primary outcome was analgesic consumption over 24 hours. And this was significantly reduced in the SA block group. Also, there was reduced pain scores and improved SATs and respirate. Uh, and interestingly, half of the patients had posterior fractures. So traditionally, serratus anterior block is considered to be most effective for anter anterior and lateral fractures. But this suggests that maybe it can also be effective for posterior fractures. And yeah, there's a multi-center trial going on at the moment in Australia. So I think they're about halfway through their recruitment. So we, we should have more evidence to support serratus anterior block over the next year or so. But already there is a reasonable level of evidence for it. So the main indication for a serratus anterior block is painful rib fractures. However, it has also been described for some other conditions. So auxiliary abscess, burns, shingles can potentially be used for those conditions as well. And there are really three nerves that we target. So firstly, the intercostal nerves, and specifically the lateral branches. And then secondly, the thoracodorsal nerve, and finally, the long thoracic nerve. And these last two nerves, you may notice, are motor nerves. And the theory here is that actually the pain from refractures can be as much from the muscles and from spasm as it is from the actual snapped bones and the broken periosteum. And just a recap of anatomy for you. So here are the intercostal nerves running between the intercostal muscles. This is the lateral branch coming out here, which itself divides into anterior and posterior branches. And this is just from another angle. So these are the lateral branches coming out here. So that's what we're targeting. We're, we're aiming to spread the local anesthetic throughout this whole region. So we're getting the lateral branches of the intercostal nerves, but also those two motor nerves, the thoracodorsal and long thoracics. And here's just another example showing those two motor nerves, thoracodorsal nerve and the long thoracic nerve. So taking out the lat dorsi and the serratus anterior muscles. And this slide just shows how well the uh, dye spreads in a cadaver. So it spreads both anteriorly, posteriorly, but also cephalocaudally. Uh, so if you, just like the fascia ilaka block, if you use a large volume of dilute anesthetic, it should spread and cover that whole region. There are two different ways you can position the patient. Firstly, with them supine and your needle coming down from above the probe. Uh, but probably my preferred 
uh, position would be having the patient lying on their side with the rib fractures up and then having your needle going um, towards the probe with the machine on the opposite side of the patient. I think that's the easiest, it's the most intuitive in terms of um, being able to follow your needle on, on the screen. Uh, so just to talk you through the technique, um, so obviously indication, painful rib fractures, contraindications, there aren't really any absolute contraindications other than the standard ones, you know, local anesthetic, uh, allergy, overlying infection. So anticoagulation is not an absolute contraindication. Uh, consent, so the main complication to talk about in consent is the risk of pneumothorax. Uh, obviously sterile technique, stop before you block is a sort of philosophy that's uh, been developed in the anesthetic community. So to prevent wrong side blocks, just like a wrong side surgery is a never event. Also a wrong side block should be a never event. So check both with the patient and with the imaging and with a colleague, get them to double check you're blocking the correct side, especially if you're positioning the patient before the block. Uh, yeah, it is a large amount of local anesthetic, so monitoring should be attached. And yeah, have an assistant to inject for you. And obviously, because it's not that common that we do them, you try and make it a, a learning experience and teach them as you go along, if you are gonna be doing one. And then adjust the depth of your screen so you can see the pleura. Use in-plane ultrasound guidance, so you can see the whole needle. Aim towards the rib, so just in case the patient sneezes and your needle sort of jerks forward, hopefully it'll bounce off the rib rather than going through the pleura. And then aim either through or just anterior to lat dorsi, avoiding the thoracodorsal artery. Hydro dissection can be really useful using saline, and then aim to dump your local between the lat dorsi and the serratus anterior muscle. It has also been described to, to go deep to serratus anterior, but there's no evidence that's any better. And I think a more superficial approach is just intuitively safer. And just like fascia iliaca, about 30 to 40 mils of 0.25 bupivacaine. And yeah, have you uh, assisted and aspirate every five mils or so. And also they can give you feedback on whether the, the fluid is going in easily or whether there's, there's resistance. And this is what it looks like on ultrasound. So you can just see a little bit of lat dorsi here coming from the right of screen, sort of tapering off as it, as it goes anteriorly. And then this is the straightest anterior. This is a rib intercostal muscle here and the pleural line is the deepest structure just there and so we're aiming to inject between serratus and lat dorsi or if you go just in front of lat, that of lat dorsi then it's just superficial to serratus anterior and this little uh, beak of lat dorsi sometimes described as like a the beak of a bird sort of tapering off as it goes anteriorly like that so hopefully that will stick in your memory and this is another view this time with the um, flipped 180 degrees. So anterior is now to the right of screen. Uh, so we're a little bit more posterior. So we can see more of lat dorsi and we can also see the thracodorsal vessels here. So yeah, when you're plotting your path with your needle, just try and avoid those vessels. So you might just go somewhere like here, just anterior to that. And again, the beak tapering off as it goes anteriorly. Okay, so next I'm just gonna play you a quick clip of a uh, serratus anterior block being done in real time from the uh, American expert, Andrew Herring, who hosts the website Highland Ultrasound. It's a fantastic website, check it out. But there's also a brilliant video of uh, him supervising someone performing a serratus anterior block. So I'll just quickly show you that. Don't do anything. Yeah, right just stay right there. Okay. I think you're too high. I'm going to test it. So okay. pull back. So this is serratus here. No blood. This is sorry, black dorsi okay. here, and this is serratus here. See how it runs back yeah. up? Yeah, too high. Yeah, so, so I think you should go a little farther. Yeah. We're going to try that again. Stay there. How do we, how do we clip this guy? So still yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Into the muscle of lap dorsi there. Yeah, that looks good. Go ahead and clip that. That's great again. Nothing. And go. Oh. Wow. Whoa. Whoa. Okay, next, just a word about uh, achieving competency in this procedure. I think the easiest way is to just get really familiar with using ultrasound for other procedures. So whenever you're doing a block for an off, use ultrasound guidance. 
And I believe that's actually now in the Arkham curriculum that we should be doing ultrasound guided fascia elarca blocks. Uh, and also obviously IV access, just get really familiar and comfortable handling the probe going from transverse to long axis. And if you're already uh, confident with those basic skills, it's really not a big leap to just transfer those skills up a few inches to the chest wall. Uh, the knowledge acquisition is quite easy. You know, there's loads of great resources online, as well as that Highland Ultrasound website I just showed you. NYSOR is another great uh, resource, the New York School of Regional Anesthesia. And then it's just a matter of just becoming familiar with the anatomy. So you're probably all already familiar with you know, ribs and the pleura. And so it's just a matter of learning what the lat dorsi and the serratus muscles look like. Uh, so you know, just play around on yourself or with colleagues. Um, and it's just a matter of you know, getting familiar with what they look like. You know, the muscle fibers look a bit different in their, if they're in long or short axis. Uh, they can be a bit bigger or smaller depending on you know, how well developed the patient's muscles are. So once you've seen it a few times, you'll just immediately uh, you know what, what those muscles look like and you'll be able to aim for that space between lat dorsi and serratus. And then it's just a question of like with any procedure, your supervision until you're confident and then some kind of triggered assessment. So that should just be um, agreed at your trust, um, collaborating with your anesthetic colleagues. Yeah, and in terms of uh, sort of the wider implementation of the pathway, obviously it's important to engage your anesthetic colleagues, but also uh, depending where you work, your know, frailty and, um, and potentially surgeons as well. And then have a standardized guideline. Uh, I think because it's not that common, it's much less common than patients with not fractures. So it's probably not practical to try and train everyone up. So I'd suggest just trying to train a relatively small group of motivated clinicians and at least get, get them all signed off. And if you are going to do it, definitely audit your data and potentially even uh, think about using some research. You know, there hasn't been much, much research on uh, rectus spiny plane blocks versus serratus blocks, for example. So it's a, I think it's a fertile soil for further research as well. Okay, and then we'll just jump back to Menti for one more question. Okay, so for patients admitted with painful rib fractures, a serratus anterior block should now be considered the standard of care. So do you agree or disagree? Obviously, I'm aware that this is a very biased audience. Okay, so everyone agrees with that statement. I, mean, I think that's right. I mean, uh, there's definitely... You know, evidence that it's effective. And I think if a patient's requiring admission for painful rib fractures, uh, yeah, I think we should aim to be providing uh, this kind of block for them. Okay, so take home points. Firstly, POCUS is more sensitive than chest X-ray. So uh, consider using it for diagnosis if you think it might actually change your management. And serratus anterior block is safe, easy, and effective. And I think in the future, it will be considered the standard of care more generally. So let's try and make this, uh, that 78 year old man, let's try and get him looking like that. And just a reminder that this is the Slack group. I think probably most of you are already in the Slack group, but if you're not, uh, there is a channel all about serratus anterior blocks. And um, one of my colleagues from King's College has already uploaded their guideline there. So feel free to look at that if you're coming up with a trust guideline yourself. That's all, it's all like a sort of wiki open access uh, sort of philosophy. And I think I just have one final mentee question for you. Yeah, so in your hospital, uh, what are the barriers to performing a block in ED? So this is a, a free text. So you can just write into the box and your answers should just appear on the screen. So what are the barriers to you performing a block? And while people are writing in, is there anything in the chat you'd like to mention, Mayred? Um, I think people are talking about the erectus spiny block. Okay. That um, yep. um, um, Timo has had good experience uh, with erectus spiny for posterior fractures and the chest strain. Um, and um, Prof Harris is saying um, that that's his normal practice now, that he would. Um, do SA block for or okay. for chest tube insertions. That's something that oh, I do not very regularly, but it's becoming my practice and it has become my practice personally myself. Mm. And um, yeah, I think definitely uh, if, if they're stable and they're having a chest strain anyway, 
Uh, and they're going to have a block anyway. Yeah, it makes sense to do the block before the chest drain for sure. Yes, absolutely. And um, you are you are putting a needle in there to give lidocaine. Might as well just use a slightly bigger needle and use leave a bit of cane instead. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then Ooh. I think yeah, there was another mention about erectus spiny block as well. Uh, um, again, that's not. I think um, it can take a few years and years for us to adopt erectus spiny. Although I, I think personally, it's easier than a safe block. Yeah, I think yeah, it's definitely the same kind of um, profile, I think, in terms of skill and also safety profile, like you're well away from important yeah. structures. Yeah, you're just going between two muscle layers. So the only thing is you, you do need to be able to at least roll the patient onto their side or onto their tummy. Yeah. You can't do it with them supine. Yeah, so that yeah, no. limit you in certain cases. Stefan is mentioning how about the save block and discharge. So I think, uh, again, uh, your leave will be thinking on a, on a best day would last 12 hours and uh, what are you going to do after that yeah. and um, Shiran is mentioning would this be a place to consider peripheral nerve catheters so we're talking about this with Michael so one of my biggest pain in life is the fact that in my trust uh, so to provide a kind of like a I was told to provide a one block service instead of doing a single shot block in ED and followed by uh, uh, another injection later on on CPOD list by anesthetist, we leave a catheter in, in recess when we do them. Uh, I personally am quite opinionated about the fact that I don't like to do that, uh, but uh, it helps the patients in the sense that after 12 hours when the single shot block is, has worn off, it kind of helps uh the anesthetist not to do another injection or for the patient not to have another injection i am aware that no one else does that and uh and that is a barrier for me writing in this uh michael uh okay. to perform running a block in ed it's just because if i am doing it i have to leave a catheter right now i don't like that mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we've managed to agree a, a pathway where we just do a single shot and then they'll try and put a catheter you know on the next theater list so I think because we're not a trauma center, we don't see as many. So we felt that was a sort of reasonable compromise. That's a very good point. Uh, what kind of catheter? It's, uh, oh gosh, I can't remember the name now. It's, it's one of those yellow tui needles uh, mm -hmm. that comes in a set of it as, as a catheter as well. Um, because it, it, we've, got a, we've got a big stash of them. So we just you go in there and you just grab them. Uh, breaking stuff for pain seems to see all around. Jesus is something else to work at a better level. Um, just, I, I don't understand what, what Prof. Harris is saying there, sorry. Uh, sorry, I was responding to some of the comments above. I mean, certainly where I work, we, we often do send people home or we admit them to CDU. I'd love to have a catheter, but I, I simply don't have one in the hospital I work in. And the, the point there was anecdotally, if you get on top of the pain with good regional anesthesia and you continue to load them with non-opiate oral analgesia once you've lowered the pain from let's say from nine to two it's much easier to keep the pain down um, with oral analgesia than it is to get on top of it so it was just anecdotally if you put a block in you may find the oral analgesia more effective than if you didn't put the block in once the block's worn off yeah i've heard that same theory yeah from some regional anesthetists they talk about the uh you know down regulating some of the the pain uh, the molecular sort of cascade uh, if you can regulate that from the beginning even a single shot block without a catheter yet yeah, may last longer than the half-life of the actual local anesthetic oh i should i should have used that argument uh <laughs> when i and i said i don't like to believe a catheter into our anesthetist uh but hey ho i've lost that battle <laughs> uh i'll just talk through some of these uh, barriers that you guys have written up uh so no guideline well yeah i think um a lot of trusts now are creating guidelines. So if someone would like to take that on as a quip uh, in your hospital, um, that would be a perfect quip, I think. Lack of skill, um, resistance to change. Yes, that's a problem with any big organization. Yeah, surgical emphysema, that's a good point. You may not just not be able to see anything. And so then yeah, you won't be able to do it safely. Um, anesthetic colleagues, that was your one, Mayor, I think. Um, <laughs> Like no radiation. <laughs> uh, time, yeah, I mean, time, 
of course it does take some time to form the block but i think if if you think of it in in terms of like a fascia iliacut block uh, you know that it's the standard of care and patients should have it then you know i think you make time i think it is an important intervention that we should prioritize uh, but yeah obviously there is problem issues with training not having enough people trained up so obviously there needs to be some kind of champion in ed maybe that person needs to go up to theater uh, and learn it in theater on some kind of uh, suitable list and then you know bring that training back down to ed and help uh, cascade that knowledge down but yeah i think you definitely need close uh, involvement with your anesthetic colleagues dogma yeah what's would you like to expand on that one who wrote the dogma dogma about ed not performing these kind of blocks or it wasn't me so <laughs> no worries cool uh so that's the end of the presentations but is there any other questions for either me or Merad, or would anyone else just like to share their experience um perhaps timo you were talking about your experience with erector spiny plane blocks i'd be interested to hear your experiences there if you'd like to share sorry i just had to get out of the room it's quite noisy here um so one second yeah i've i've done not plenty but a few um over the last uh weeks and um they were quite promising because they actually managed to take the pain away almost completely and i've done also quite a few of serratus anterior blocks which seem to be working but uh always like three to five points on the pain scale uh, maximum so um yeah we're, we're also uh looking into a new or updating our guidelines at the royal london and there are a few guys from the Royal London here that are very motivated as well. So um, yeah, we'll see what's coming and I'll have a look at the King's guidelines as well. So. Yeah, actually yeah, I'll just, I've just posted in the chat the, the invite link for the Slack group. I think most of you are already on it, but if you're not, you can just join through that link. And yeah, there's various channels that you can join. One of them, Serratus Anterior Block Channel has, has some um, documents there. So feel free to download them. Anyone else like to comment or share their experiences? Feel free just to unmute yourself and shout out if you like. I was just interested in the comment about the anaesthetist stopping people in the ED block. I mean, with respect, what business is it of anybody outside your department to stop you? Um, I must say, I, my personal thing is just do it. You never get anywhere without pushing barriers and sometimes you know pushing barriers means you lose an uh, a few interpersonal relationships and if you're doing something that's in the best interests of your patient you're trained to do it you're doing it with adequate governance um then really to, to let somebody from outside your department dictate your practice is concerning couldn't agree more hmm. yep yep totally yeah, where I work, actually, a lot of the anaesthetists aren't skilled in this at all, actually. Like, they often will know how to do an epidural, but they won't have ever done one of these thoracic wall blocks. Uh, and we're really the ideal people, I think, to do them because you know, we see the patient at the, at the front door and uh, you know, it's intuitive that the earlier you can put one of these blocks, the more effective. So I think it's a fantastic skill for us to try and train ourselves up in. And usually, I mean, most anaesthetists that I've met actually are incredibly supportive. Certainly where I am here, they, the last meeting I had with them was only on Sunday because they'd invited me to, they've got a block room and I just wanted to extend my skill and they just invited me in and offered to, to come up to the ED any time to teach us, not to take over, but to teach. Hmm. Um, and, and certainly when I was at, in, in the UK, Fred Sage and his colleagues, who I think might be near you, Michael, I'm, I'm, they're, they're in Surrey or, or various parts okay. of Surrey. They were awesome. I mean, we, we put together a course to teach a number of blocks, not serratus anterior, but the support they gave was absolutely fantastic. And I'm sure wherever you are, there will be one or two voices within the department that would support you if you approach them with maturity, evidence, and knowledge. Yep, absolutely. Totally agree. Yeah. Great. Any other comments or questions?
Fantastic. Well, we'll put this recording up on the Slack group and yeah, feel free to continue the conversation there as well. If you have any other questions, um, you can contact us all through the Slack group. We're hoping to sort of build a community there. Uh, so you're also welcome to invite friends and colleagues to that group. Thanks very much, Mayrad, for your excellent talk. Thank you all for joining Thank us. You. And the next talk uh, next month, uh, I should have already checked when this is going to be, but I'll just quickly look it up and let you know. So it's generally the first Tuesday of each month. So next month will be Six. the 6th of July, yes. And Baynaz will be talking about lung ultrasound and then Angus will be sharing some juicy echo cases. So we'll post the joining link to that session on the Slack group as well. well. Michael, could I just ask you, I mean, you've been kind enough to invite me, but I have a sort of link to London. How happy are you guys for me to invite trainees from where I am now? Oh no, please do, yeah. I mean, it's, it's uh that's the whole philosophy of the group is just sharing knowledge so uh yeah one of my friends from sweden is joining tonight so yeah that's that's absolutely fine please share as widely as you like you're very kind appreciate that thank you pleasure okay well thanks very much everyone for joining and i'll hopefully see you next month thank you